Hi, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Diplomacy Classroom. I'm Lauren Fisher with the National Museum of American Diplomacy, and thank you for joining us today. We have a really interesting program planned, La Amistad and Upholding Democracy. I am grateful that NAMAD's public historian, uh, Dr. Allison Mann, will be joining us, helping us dig deep into the story of La Amistad, which was a ship spotted off the coast of Long Island, New York in 1839. And as we explore this story, she will help us connect it to diplomacy. Uh, but I wanted to remind you, our listening audience and our fans of diplomacy, that in addition to, today, in, to today's program, if you're interested in African-American history, please visit our website for additional information about how the museum's collection, our artifacts and our objects, further explore the contribu contributions of African-Americans to diplomacy. Um, and in fact, I think we can drop a uh, link to those resources in our chat. So you can go to our website and explore that for ourselves. And uh, speaking of the chat, we will be taking your questions at the conclusion of our discussion. So please post your, your thoughts and your comments and your questions. Participate, we wanna hear from you. Um, and if you know someone who would be interested in this program but was not able to make it today, or if you're not able to uh, watch this live broadcast in its entirety, we are recording this segment. We will post the link to the program back onto our website. So feel free to return to our website, diplomacy.state.gov or share the link with those that you think would be interested in watching. Um, we'd love to have you share our content. Thank you so much. Remember it's diplomacy.state.gov and you can also follow us on social media our, our handle is at NAMAD Museum. That way you can stay on top of our future programs. And as Allison likes to remind us, these programs are a group effort. There are lots of museum staff working behind the scenes to, to produce programs such as this. NAMAD researcher, Catherine, Eric, our collections manager, um, our unfailing producer, Elizabeth, who also serves as our education assistant who ensure these programs run smoothly and are a success. So thank you to all of you. Um, and Elizabeth will be monitoring the, the, the chat box for those questions, as well as sharing her screen to show us some slides later on. So thank you to all of you. And as part of the mission of the National Museum of American Diplomacy, we highlight historical events that connect to diplomacy. And that is the purpose of today's program. So I'm gonna go ahead and invite my friend and colleague, Dr. Mann to the screen to help us explore further the fascinating story of La Amistad. Hey, Ali, how you doing? Hi, Lauren, how are you doing? Hi, diplomacy fans out there, welcome. We're, yes, we're so anxious to have you with us today to help us kind of further explore this story of La Amistad. And I mentioned at the top, La Amistad was a ship that was spotted off the coast of Long Island in 1839, but it also was a part of a, of a Supreme Court case, the U.S. versus La Amistad. Can you connect these dots for us? How does this connect to diplomacy? Yeah, that's the that's the um, the big question of the day, isn't it? Because folks who are familiar with this case, they normally think of it as a abolitionist story, as an enslaved story, which it is. Um, but the thrust of the argument and what will eventually liberate um, the kidnapped Africans will be international law. And it had to be adjudicated in the US courts. Mm. So that's really what we wanna focus on today because that's the, the meat of the matter. And I think a lot of people are kind of surprised to think about it in this particular context. Excellent. Well, how about we go back to the beginning of the story? And I know Elizabeth has some slides that she'd like to share with us. And we, we've picked out some really um, compelling images that I think are going to guide your telling of the story as we move through it. Yeah, let's walk through it, Lauren, because it's, it's you know, it's a complicated story. It's not an easy story to, to tell. 
And so let's go to the first slide because I think maps and geography will help quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So for our audience who you know, is, is familiar with um, the history behind the international slave trade, they may remember that the US Constitution prohibited the, um, the Atlantic slave trade past 1808. So that may be their familiarity. That doesn't have any bearing on the case that will eventually come to court. So I just wanted to just bring that up um, first and foremost, uh, even though even though the international slave trade did exist in the United States all the way up to the Civil War, but still, um, the, what I'm going to focus on here, and I'll mention it a few times, is a 1795 treaty between the United States and Spain that happened during George Washington's second administration. And then the second treaty is between uh, Spain and Great Britain that happened in 1817, okay? So I just wanna just put that out there before I, I get started with all of this because we'll keep referring back to those treaties. And right there, we got, we have, it's about international relations, right? We have, a tr we have treaties and it's, it's, it's an agreement between the United States and Spain. So right there, we're already looking at how this is involved with diplomacy. Very much so. And Lauren, at the museum, we often talk about treaties being a tool of diplomacy. Mm -hmm. And treaties are only as valid as um, those countries that are willing to abide by them, right? Mm -hmm. so, okay. so that's really the crux of the matter here too. Good. But in 1839, where our story starts, uh, it starts in Western Africa. So you see there that we have the modern map of Africa pointing mm -hmm. out Sierra Leone. And uh, then to the left is a 19th century map giving a little bit more of a bird's eye, smaller view of the country as it would have looked like. Um, so the international slave trade had been outlawed um, in, in Spain due to that 1817 treaty between the Spanish and the British. Okay? okay, so already illegal. However, there are agents that are on the ground in Africa that continue this, this horrendous practice. And for the captives who found themselves aboard La Amistad, their story starts there in their homeland. Um, the majority of the La Amistad captives were uh, considered to be Mendi. Mendi is an, is an ethnic group uh, from Sierra Leone, but about a hundred miles inland. And so uh, these Africans who were kidnapped, um, pawned into slavery, they had to, they were forced to march about a hundred miles from the inland to the coastal areas to begin the long horrendous uh, middle passage. And the slaver, the Portuguese slaver ship that would bring um, the eventually the La Amistad captives to Cuba, that particular ship held about 500 souls on that ship. Mm -hmm. um, so the La Amistad captives were able to talk in great detail later on about you know the horror of not only kidnapped, um, enslaved, and then forced, you know, by the middle of passage. So this is where, this is where our story starts. So 500 souls aboard that Portuguese slaver on its way to Cuba. So Lauren, why do you think that um, it would be going to Cuba? Um, well, that's, Cuba then was part of Spain. And I would imagine there they had plantations that they needed slaves to work on. So correct. Um, so slavery, um, just as in the United States, was legal in the island of Cuba. And Cuba was considered by the Spanish Empire to be the, the jewel of the Caribbean. It was mm -hmm. by far their most profitable um, colony. They had been um, slowly uh, you know, losing their colonies um, in South America in Central America, but in the Caribbean, the sugar trade, you know, was really making just so much money for the Spanish. And within the island itself, um, slavery was legal. And mm -hmm. so what was not legal under, under their own laws was to kidnap Africans mm -hmm. and forcibly bring them to the island of Cuba. But this is what happened. So the souls who were brought um, from that slave ship that landed in Havana. This is where uh, the La Amistad captives found themselves um, in Havana, Cuba. You know, very bewildered, as you can imagine. And um, 
they spent a number of days there uh, in Havana, and then they were sold. They were purchased mm -hmm. by two Cuban Spaniards by the names of Montez and uh, Ruiz, mm -hmm. who purchased uh, 53 Africans mm -hmm. total. And they were illegally classified as being Cuban born. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So Lauren, th that's important. That's important mm -hmm. for our audience to understand. Mm -hmm. So why do you think then they would forge that classification there to state that they were Cuban born? Well, that meant they were legal in Cuba to be slaves because as you pointed out, slavery it was legal on the island. So Absolutely. if they were Cuban, they were slaves and that was the end of it. Absolutely correct. So of the 53 uh, people who were purchased by uh, Ruiz and Montez, there were four children okay. and um, yeah, and 49 um, adult men that were purchased. And then too, if you were going to transport your property, you also needed permission. And that was given by the royal governor of Cuba. So because it was part of the Spanish empire, it was governed by a royal governor. And mm -hmm. so this is an important piece of the trial evidence too. So Ruiz and Montez, they got a piece of paper from the royal governor that allowed them to then transport their property to another side of the island. And you can see by this map, you know, how mm -hmm. many sugar mills existed and how, you know, this was just such a lucrative mm -hmm. um, so the, the black triangles indicate a, a sugar mill. There. Exactly. Yeah, so and then the green areas are sugar cane cultivation. Oh, so yeah. not only were they growing it, yeah. they were milling the sugar, and then that would be their principal export product. So Ruiz and Montez, they were in Havana, which you could see at the top of the screen. Mm -hmm. And they were going to take a three-day journey to transport um, the Africans over to... Do you see where... Um, where Hukaro is kind of in the middle of the island, that's where they owned uh, sugar plantations. So okay. it was about a three day sail. Okay. Okay. And uh, this was in, um, this was in June of 1839. So um, let's go to the next slide because so that journey yeah, did you have a question? Yeah, well, I was just gonna clarify. So they had the legal paper that said Yes. These individuals were slaves um, mm -hmm. and that I'm thinking somebody looked the other way when those captives came off the boat and they were clearly not from Cuba. They were coming oh, from yeah, somewhere absolutely. else. Absolutely. And right. Ruiz and Montez, they, they knew it, you right. know, they knew it themselves. Right. Absolutely. Um, so uh, of these 53 people who were on board the ship, so Ruiz and Montez did not own their own ship. They chartered a ship to, uh, you know, bring the people that they had enslaved over to the other side of the island. And it was a small crew. There was a captain. Uh, the captain had an enslaved teenager named Antonio. I'm going to bring him up again. So remember Antonio and a couple of sailors. So a really small crew and a cook and a cook. So the enslaved Africans were down below deck and uh, the cook made a, a point of taunting them and uh, communicating to them that, you know, they were going to be killed and eaten and cooked and, you know, all kinds of horrific, gruesome things. And so for these Mendi uh, tribes people, they determined that they would fight for their freedom, that this mm -hmm you know, that they were not going to allow themselves to be, you know, captives. And so uh, in the early morning, uh, about four o'clock in the morning, uh, there was an uprising. And so the Africans loosened their chains and uh, immediately grabbed um, swords. And as you can see, very well depicted in this 20th century piece of art, mm -hmm. uh, fought their freedom. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first person they killed, by the way, was the cook. <laughs> so... Yeah, that, yeah, that, that was, uh, you know, that was something that, that happened immediately. And the Africans, you know, testified to that because they, they yeah. saw him as being, you know, chief but, Dean. They also did kill the captain of the ship. Yeah. Um, yeah. Two sailors jumped overboard, um, presumably died uh, in the waters, but they did not um, kill everybody on board in search of their freedom. So they kept alive Ruiz and Montez and also Antonio. So mm -hmm. why do you think then, Lauren, that they would spare the Spaniards who had illegally purchased them? They knew how to 
sail the ship. They needed to, they needed to figure out how to get back home and they needed someone to get them there. Yeah, exactly. I mean, being disoriented and being unclear actually where you were, um, this was very wise. This was very smart. And Antonio was spared because he could speak a little bit of Mendy. Oh. Antonio had been illegally enslaved um, by the captain of the ship when he was a young boy and fluent in Spanish, but still remembered a little bit of Mendy. Mm -hmm. So it was through Antonio that the Africans were able to communicate to Ruiz and Montez, look, pilot us back to our homeland or you're uh, you're going to suffer the same fate. Yeah. And so uh, this very colorful mural, I just want to point out too, uh, this is part of a four-part series, and it was painted by an African-American artist named Hale Woodruff mm -hmm. in 1939. And these murals uh, currently are on display at the uh, Savory Library in Talladega College in Alabama. They're very, they're very large. Very, mm -hmm. and, uh, yep. So they depict the uprising, the trial, and then eventually they return to the homeland. Excellent. And so they're on La Amistad at this point. And what's so ironic looking at this scene is that the translation from Spanish into English of La Amistad is friendship. So that's what's just so ironic here. Yes, absolutely. Um, so the Spaniards, however, they will not pilot the ship to the east. They pilot it mm -hmm. to the north. Mm -hmm. So Lauren, why do you think then they would pilot to the North? Well, uh, the relationship the United States had with Spain. Exactly. Slavery existed also in the United States. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So the Spaniards uh, believed that, that if they could get intercepted by an American ship, that they would be saved. Mm -hmm. And so for about two months from July 2nd, when the uprising happened, mm -hmm would straggle across the coast. Um, you know, they stop and they think in like South Carolina, pick up provisions and just kind of keep on going. Oh. And so eventually uh, they made their way up to Long Island and they uh, were spotted by people on Long Island who saw this, this, uh, this ship and saw Africans on board and they alerted the Navy um, because the Navy had a large presence in Connecticut in uh, mm -hmm. the New London area. And so the Navy went out there, found the, the Spaniards and the Africans and could not ascertain at all what was going on. And so they just towed the entire ship and they threw everybody in jail in, in New Haven <laughs> so they could you know, sort out kind of, kind of what was going on. So it, you know, language, we often talk about this, Lauren, and communication, it's, mm -hmm. it's part of diplomacy. So here you have a language barrier, but who do you think has the upper hand in this language barrier? Well, someone who can speak English, um, but I would imagine Ruiz and Montez spoke Spanish. So maybe there's, it's just a little bit easier for them to be able to communicate with those that speak English is probably someone else who speaks Spanish that they could work with. Mendy exactly. would be a, probably a little harder to find. Right. So in, in terms of telling the side of the story, Ruiz and Montez speak a little bit of English and it's not that difficult to find someone who speaks Spanish. And they say that, you know, there was this slave rebellion and thank you for rescuing us. Now we would very much like to go back to Cuba with our, with our property. And the Spanish foreign minister in Washington, D.C. gets a hold of this story. Mm -hmm. News traveled pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And he goes banging on the door of the White House and says uh, to the president, Martin Van Buren, who's president at the time, um, hey, there's Spanish people, <laughs> there's Spanish people and also property. Um, can we get this wrapped up? And, you know, the Africans need to go back. Well, not Africans, because they were calling them Cuban slaves, but they need to go back to Cuba to stand trial for murder. And so Van Buren and the Secretary of State, John Forsyth, they do not want an international incident with the mm. Spanish at all. Mm -hmm not one iota. So Van Buren says, okay, I'm gonna send a federal marshal up to Connecticut, you know, get you your property back, tie this up and just be done with it. But not so fast. Okay. Not so fast. There were in Connecticut, a very small but vocal, pretty well organized group of abolitionists. 
uh, the Connecticut Anti-Slavery Society had just been formed a couple of years before. And of course, you know, it's a small town and, you know, you, this, this created quite a furor. And almost immediately abolitionists who went and saw the scene were just like, you know, no, they're not Cuban slaves. These are, these are clearly okay. Africans. These are clearly Africans. And so they were able to get an injunction against that federal marshal seizing um, seizing the Africans and giving them back to the Spaniards. So they stepped right in. I'm sure the Martin Van Buren administration wasn't too happy about this. Uh, no, not yeah. in the <laughs> Let's go to the next slide and talk a little yeah. bit about those abolitionists. Because I mentioned at the top of it that it, this story is often framed as a story of abolition. Mm -hmm. But it's really important for our audience to understand that in 1839, the majority of white Americans tacitly supported slavery, didn't think much about it. Um, they did not consider themselves to be anti-slavery or abolitionist mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. um, this was a very, very small percentage of the population mm -hmm. um, that would would even bother, you know, to to find this out. So the abolitionists, and this is Lewis Tappan here on the left, and mm -hmm. he's. He was an abolitionist from New York and also very wealthy. So they could organize, however. So they organized an Amistad committee mm -hmm. and they contributed funds to the legal defense of the Africans because almost immediately when they sent someone in to speak to the Africans, they knew they were African. They didn't speak Spanish. I mean, so yeah, if you were born enslaved in Cuba, you're going to speak Spanish. speak Spain. I mean, you're Spanish. Not Exactly. You yeah. were not going to be fluent in, in Mendy. And so to them, you know, this was this was an open and, and, and uh, closed case here. They also um, really wanted to bring attention to their cause. So there was a moral force driving them, mm -hmm. but they also wanted to get as much publicity as they could for their cause, even though this was not about American slavery. It still was about the horrors and it still was about the fact that the Atlantic slave trade was continuing. They, they very much wanted to bring publicity to it. And so the case started to make its way through the circuit courts. And uh, that black and white picture there is a New Haven old courthouse where one mm -hmm. of the trials in the circuit court was held. And I say circuit court because those are federal courts. So because this involved international law, this was always going to be a federal case. Which kind of now connects me to sort of the title of our program, which is La Amistad, La, La Amistad Upholding Democracy, because really what you have are U.S. citizens using our own constitution and our own courts. I mean, you said that they crafted an injunction to stop this. So we were, they were using our own democratic process um, to, to, to really get to the truth of the matter here, because as much as they know they're not Cubans, has it really been uh, acknowledged that they were illegally taken? Correct. And the U.S. federal government was claiming that they were the property of the Spaniards. So here you had U.S. citizens pitted against the federal government. Mm -hmm. The federal government was trying to pull something illegal by international law, but it was American citizens who stepped up and said no, and they would use the court system, which is very much a democratic institution. Absolutely. Great. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about how they were able to make their case because the abolitionists kept winning the cases in the circuit court, but each time the Van Buren administration would challenge it. So it kept going higher and higher. So let's move on to the next slide. And I want to talk a little bit about um, the Africans because this was not the abolitionists who were stating the case for them, they had to get testimony from the Africans themselves. But again, there was that language barrier. And so I want to um, you know, bring to our audience maybe a name that they're not particularly familiar with, and that is James Covey. Mm -hmm. So James Covey uh, was about 15 in uh, 1840. And he would wind up being the chief interpreter um, between the abolitionists and the Africans. And so how he becomes to be that way is, is kind of interesting. One of the abolitionists who was a linguist and he taught at Yale University, his name was Josiah Gibbs. 
he recognized that they could not testify in court unless they could speak to the Africans and they could figure out what had happened. Mm -hmm. So he devised a way to find someone who spoke Mendy and English. He learned from um, the Africans how to count to 10 in Mendy. He then went to the docks in New York and just went all day long, up and down the docks, just counting at the top of his lungs in Mendy, <laughs> over and over again until finally he got the attention of James Covey who heard him and said, what, are, are you speaking Mendy? Oh my and he goodness. said, I am indeed, do you speak Mendy? And James Covey said, I speak Mendy. I was born in Africa and I am ethnically Mendy. And uh, James Covey's story, it fits into that international trade story. Um, mm -hmm. He was born in Africa, mm -hmm. illegally enslaved um, by Spaniards. And after they captured him, that ship was making its way west when it was intercepted by a British ship. Because of that treaty between Spain and Great Britain in 1817, the British claimed the right to seize any ship that was believed to be illegally transporting people Ooh. in Africa. And so James Covey was liberated by the so Britain. Britain did the right thing there. Britain did the right thing. Good they for did. Britain. But I don't know, not quite the right thing because they didn't return James Covey back to Africa. Okay. Okay. All right, so there's that. Um, but James Covey would be brought up um, on ships. He became a sailor. And uh, by the time that Josiah Gibbs found him, he had been employed in the British Navy. So retained his, his okay. complete fluency in Mendy, okay. um, but then also spoke English completely fluently. So he was the perfect interpreter. So Josiah Gibbs uh, brought James Covey back to Connecticut. And that is where they will then begin to unpack the full story of what had happened from the time um, that uh, Sinke here, we have a... Um, a drawing of him. He's probably the, the most well-known mm -hmm. of the Amistad, the adult Amistad uh, captives. And his Mendy name was Sing, uh, Singbe uh, Pia, but he would take on the name Joseph Sinke. And uh, Sinke would talk about how he had been married, had children in Africa. He mm -hmm. described his kidnapping. Mm -hmm. He described the Middle Passage. You know, he also described the rebellion and made it very clear that the cook, yeah, made, yeah the cook said, you're all going to die and that they were fighting for their freedom. This is not piracy. This is not murder. We are free born Africans. And so through the interpreter and the translator, uh, the full story would, able, would be able to be told. On they the, were on able the to get those personal accounts. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, Ruiz and Montez, you know, they had nothing. I mean, all they were doing was like waving their, <laughs> waving their fake, uh, their, their Ruiz, fake you know, papers, you know, paper, right. Their phony paperwork, which yeah. the Van Buren administration was fine. Oh, it was signed by the Royal governor. Okay. It must be bad. Yeah. You know, we didn't want any trouble with that, but that was all the, that was all they could provide to the courts. You know, they didn't have anything else. I mean, you had here, the Africans providing their eyewitness testimony. And once it was able to be translated completely and presented in court, it was extremely compelling, but the Van Buren administration continued to fight it. So uh, in our court system, Lauren, what happens when appeal after appeal after appeal, like what happens then? It just finds its way to the Supreme Court. It finds its way to the highest court in the land. So let's talk about that. Now we're up to uh, 1840, early 1841. And this was going to be the, the end of it because the Supreme Court is the highest court in the land. And the abolitionists knew that they would need a real powerhouse to argue this case before the United States Supreme Court. And that powerhouse turned out to be John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams, a native uh, from Massachusetts, mm -hmm. had been a U.S. Senator. He had been uh, Secretary of State. Uh, he had been um, President. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> yes. I mean, too many. accomplished. Just a bit. Well, Good resume. Federal office that, that you can imagine. And one of our nation's most brilliant Secretaries of State. 
knew international law like the back of his hand because he had been instrumental in formulating a lot of international law. Mm -hmm. So he really was the perfect person to present this argument before the court. And so uh, he will take a personal interest in uh, the Amistad captive mm -hmm. and does want to know a lot of their story. And they are very eager to tell their story. So another aspect of the story that often gets lost in the popular telling of the tale is the four children that mm -hmm. were born mm -hmm. Four children, three girls and, and one boy who were under the age of 12. So between the ages of nine and 12 uh, were on board La Amistad. They were not imprisoned with the adults, but they were kept in the house of the jailer who employed them, employed them, not paid them, but you know what I mean, use them as uh, domestic servants. And uh, Kale here was about nine or 10 years old at the time that this comes to trial. And he practices a bit of diplomacy himself. He will write some letters to John Quincy Adams because it's made clear to the children who pick up English very quickly. Yeah, I was just gonna say. Yeah. Yeah. The abolitionists, um, you know, they're evangelicals. That's another important part of the mm -hmm. story here. And they are very intent on Christianizing the Africans. And so they will teach them to read and write English um, using the Bible. And so the children pick it up very quickly, Kale in particular. And if we move on to the next slide, the Massachusetts Historical Society has some of the original letters uh, that Kale wrote mm. to John Quincy Adams. So Kale, being nine or ten years old, he understands that he can't he can't go on trial, like he can't sit in the witness chair. But he wants his story to be told. He writes this letter in English to John Quincy Adams, where he describes exactly what happened on board the ship. You know, here, I hope our audience can see a little bit. He does talk about, you know, the cook who said um, that they were going to kill them and cut them. And uh, there's just a couple of parts of this letter that I, I want to read, Lauren. And this is dated on the 4th of January, 1841. So very, very shortly before the trial is about to begin. He said, I want to tell you to tell the great court these, these things. Jose Ruiz says we were born in Havana. He tell lie. We stay in Havana 10 days and 10 nights. We all born in Mendy. We now understand Spanish language. We want you to ask the court what we have done wrong. Yeah. And then he goes on to say, all we want is make us free, not send us to Havana, send us home. Your friend, Kale. Yeah, your friend. Your friend. Very, I mean, what's um, so impressive, the ship is, Amistad is found in 1839. This is 1841. So that gives you a sense of how much time has passed since they were captured. Writes English beautifully. Just, I mean, that is so beautiful, his handwriting and so eloquent that he uses English. You know, it's just very impressive. And also very savvy. Because, yeah. you know, part of diplomacy, we talk about this a lot, Lauren, is, is awareness and cultural awareness. Mm -hmm. And so the children and also the adults um, understood that Christianity was extremely important. important to these Americans who were helping them. And so they would weave in, um, they, they would weave in biblical verse sometimes um, in their letters and, and speaking to the mm -hmm. abolitionists. As a, as a persuasion tool yeah. and also as a way of, um, you know, getting down to the same level of communication, that this was the best way that they felt that they could state their case and also mm -hmm. their gratitude. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting a sense too, that the stories are all consistent. Like they're not finding any, you know, so it's, 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 you know, it's obvious that they were kidnapped out of Sierra Leone, they're Mendy, because everyone's story is consistent here, down to the cook of how horrible he was. I know exactly. Right. right. Um, so let's uh, let's move on to the next slide, and we'll talk about the case itself. Uh, and, and this is what Adams will, I mean, this is really the linchpin, you know, number one, mm -hmm. clearly they're Africans, they're not Cubans. Um, so, so the defense, um, well, the United States will offer up this idea for the Spanish that 
uh, you know, well, it's not entirely inconceivable. They wouldn't speak Spanish because, you know, sometimes there are tribes and they're not, they're just speaking their native tongue and blah, blah, blah. you know, it's just ludicrous and it, it doesn't really hold water. And so um, the case will be argued. John Quincy Adams himself will speak for about nine hours about the complexity of international law mm -hmm. and how important it is to uphold. And, and what Adams will drive home is that the United States is not asking Spain to do anything illegal. It's asking Spain to abide by its own treaty. The Spanish are asking the United States to abide by a treaty from 1795, but that treaty is not applicable not applicable if the property, the human property is not property. And so Adams will continue to drive that point home. Okay. Yes, and will be successful. So the Supreme Court judges, again, this is not an adjudication or any kind of um, judgment against American slavery. Seven of those nine judges are enslavers themselves. And this is, a case of international law. And so Chief Justice Joseph Story will, will read um, for the court the ruling and he said, they were never the lawful slaves of the Spaniards or any other Spanish subject. They are natives of Africa. Mm -hmm. were kidnapped there and were unlawfully transported to Cuba in violation of the laws mm -hmm. and treaties of Spain, mm -hmm. not the United States, of Spain. Um, and then uh, he will say in terms of that treaty between Spain and the United States, the treaty with Spain could never have been intended to take away the equal rights of all foreigners who should assert their claims to equal justice before the courts of the United States or to deprive such foreigners of the protection mm -hmm. given to them by other treaties in the general law of nations. So, this, so it's clear. Yes, and very. A resounding victory, and so the court declares that uh, they are they are free people, and this is uh, you know one of the most remarkable items that that come out of that era. Uh, this was generously this image was generously given to us by our friends at Adams National Historic Park, which is in Quincy, Massachusetts, and they also have a very nice Amistad booklet that mm. uh, can be downloaded via, via PDF. But this was an 1838 Bible that was given to John Quincy Adams via Lewis Tappan um, from the captives of the Amistad after the case was over. And you can see there that it's signed by Sinke and Kale signed it at the bottom and Kina, one of the other Africans. And it goes on to just describe, you know, their, their gratitude for taking the case and for arguing it um, because they understood that it was these American courts that guaranteed their freedom. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping the United States and does the right thing and returns them home. Uh, they will not. No, oh, if they're like the British, they don't return. They didn't return Covey home either. No, no, they will not. And so between the course of, of what's going on with presidential administrations, there's an election in 1840. Mm -hmm. William Henry Harrison comes to the presidency in 1841, will die a month later. So by the time that um, the case is being adjudicated, John Tyler is president of the United States. He is an enslaver from Virginia. Oh, yeah. And so it would have been up to the presidential administration to, you know, give over a naval ship, you know, to transport, but they, they refused to do so. And so it'll be abolitionists who raise the money privately to charter a ship uh, to return the Africans to Africa. And that will be accomplished about eight months later in November. So you see here at the bottom of the Bible here, November 6th. So this was uh, right before they departed. Okay. And you know, Lauren, in terms of gift giving, that's an also a very important part of, of diplomacy. So why do you think that uh, the Mendy people would have given John Quincy Adams a Bible? Well, they were not Christian themselves, although you did mention that some of them were Christian. I think in, in other conversations, you've mentioned that some of them were Christianized, especially the children, because they had an opportunity two years living in the United States of studying Christianity. But they but Quincy, I mean, you know, uh, was a Christian. So they're acknowledging who he is yes. by giving him this Bible. Exactly. It's a it's a gift of respect. Yeah. because uh, the adults and the children understood that this was a very important text that uh, was important to a person like John Quincy Adams. And mm -hmm. so I think it was the perfect gift to give. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
It's beautiful too. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the, the about the aftermath. Um, mm-hmm. and so James Covey, by the way, for our audience, will will go with the Amistad um, captives. Will go with the Africans in oh, November 1941. Okay. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yep, so uh, they arrive uh, in Sierra Leone in early 1842. And I wanna talk for a second about Sarah Margaret Kinson, who was one of the Amistad children. Mm -hmm. And uh, she took on the name of Sarah Kinson on her own. Um, A lot of the Amistad captives would take on Westernized names like Mm -hmm. Joseph Kincaid did. And so Margaret, as she was known in Africa, took on Sarah Kinson as a Mm -hmm. first and last name. And she would go by Sarah Margaret Kinson for for much Mm -hmm. of her life. When she returns to Sierra Leone, um, missionaries accompany them. And so, you know, it's not like they could just pick up where they left off. Um, It was still bewildering and very disorienting, especially for the children. They did not know how to get back to their families. And so a lot of the Amistad captives would remain. Um, with the missionaries and they would stay in the settlement there in Freetown. And this was true of Margaret. And while she was uh, living there with the missionaries, she decided that she really wanted a westernized American education. And she wrote to Lewis Tappan, who remained her benefactor in some ways, and asked if she could be enrolled in school in the United States. And at this time, she was about 16. This would have been about 1846. And Tappan agreed, and he arranged for her to be enrolled in Oberlin College, which during that time was the only college in America who would admit women as college students. Mm -hmm. And so Sarah Margaret Kinson found herself uh, in Ohio taking, taking classes, and she would remain there for a couple of semesters. She excelled in, in music. She really liked to play the accordion and mathematics was brilliant in math, but uh, was was very isolated and, and lonely there. Um, she would write letters to Tappan explaining, um, you know, it's the cold and the dark and longing for Africa and longing to return, you know, grateful for the opportunity as she mm-hmm. saw it mm-hmm. to get this education, but very much wanting to return. And so we do believe uh, that she is America's first female international college student. I mean, certainly the first uh, female international college student from Africa, but we do believe the first. That's so cool. And I, you know, for those of our audience listening, I mean, exchange students and, you know, providing opportunities for U.S. students to study abroad or for foreign students to study in the U.S., that's an important part of what the State Department does. And we see that as an important part of diplomacy and building and maintaining relationships with other countries. So, it's very fitting that you would you would sort of bring that to our attention that she's considered the first international exchange student really. Well, let's go back. She is exchanged because she mm-hmm. returns. Let's go to the next slide right. because there is a building that remains on Oberlin um, that mm-hmm. Margaret was known to take classes in the Little Red Schoolhouse. Um, so this would date back from the 1840s, early 1850s where uh, Margaret did take classes there at Oberlin. Oh. But she will return to Africa and she will take up a teaching position in one of the missionary schools. Um, She does get married and uh, it's a little bit unclear what what happens to her afterwards. The the husband is dismissed. Um, He's also a teacher and she will go with him. And it's believed she lives until about the 1880s. The best uh, documented um, uh, case of one of the Amistad children is Kale because Kale remains uh, in in the missionary settlement there and lives until the 20th century. Oh, wow. Didn't know that. That's incredible. That's incredible. Wow. Um, what a fascinating story. Seriously. So do we have any more slides? Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. In our exhibit. Um, so for our audience members who were never able to visit the museum, we have a preview exhibit up right now. Mm-hmm. And uh, so before, uh, you know, COVID, um, you know, stopped our interactions with the public, folks were coming in. And this story about the Amistad is featured in our democracy mm-hmm. pillar. Mm-hmm. And as you brought up at the beginning, Lauren, uh, it's, it's often a little bit jarring, I think, for people to see the word democracy and then to go in and, you know, hear mm-hmm. the story about international slave trade and, you know, how that sort of makes sense. Right. But what's so striking is that you have, as you've laid out so amazingly, you have the citizens of the United States 
exercising their rights, challenging um, because of the way our court system is de designed, challenging what the federal government was saying had to be so. And so you have these juxtaposing sort of pictures that of the federal government and their sort of policies and the citizens challenging that. And I think, you know, one thing that our foreign service officers do as they serve abroad is to present other, other countries with sort of our democratic ideals. And this is such an amazing example of how a democratic society works where you have the citizens that exercise these rights. And um, it's a beautiful example of that. That's a really good way of putting it, Lauren. Mm -hmm. And I mean, in a nutshell, American democracy seeks to enslave these freeborn Africans, but American democracy is also what frees them in the end. Amazing. So I think there's one more slide here that shows some resources um, that our participants here can take a look at. The Adams National Historic Park is certainly something that helps to tell this story. The Amistad Research Center in partnership with Tulane. I mean, there's just some amazing um, organizations that have done research and work into this story. Um, and again, you can sort of rewatch this, this presentation once you return to our website. But I would like to take it now to um, some questions. And to kind of kick us off, I, I do have one that I would like to, to offer you, um, Allison, is did this, I mean, because the, civil, the, the American Civil War is just like 22, 20 years in the future, right? Mm -hmm. And so did this case, fuel that that movement to abolish slavery? Uh, not so much. It really did not move the needle. Because one would think it would. Well, I mean, one, the way that we've laid it out, one would think that it wouldn't. Um, you know, even up until the eve of the Civil War, you know, American abolitionists were still a very small percentage of the population. Mm -hmm. And even they couldn't decide amongst themselves if what they were looking for was emancipation or were they looking for racial equality? You know, th there was no um, you know, consensus even among them. And so this case, while it did bring attention to the abolitionist cause, it was still more focused on um, you know, the, the horrors of the Middle Passage. Mm. And they weren't really able to translate it that well into the horrors of domestic American slavery. Right. So yeah, you, you would think so. Interesting. Um, well, this is um, Howard has a kind of a, a, a question and, and maybe some of it is redundant, but I'll ask it anyway. How did Americans who s supported the freedom of the Amistad Africans, but weren't abolitionists, how did they reconcile the idea that these people had the human right to freedom, but enslaved people in the United States did not? Uh, well, I would recommend that our viewers take a look at the work of Dr. Kahinde Andrews, um, who talks a lot about white cognitive dissonance and also white psychosis, because you really have to separate yourself from uh, reality, <laughs> you know, to be like, like I said, seven of those nine Supreme Court justices were enslavers. And so one of the ways that they had of convincing themselves that what they were doing was just and right was number one, that mm -hmm. their slaves were Christianized. And two, that they were, um, they were father figures, that they were protecting them, you know, the whole paternalist mm -hmm. myth of mm -hmm. slavery. You know, it, it's, um, it's hard for us to even, you know, grapple with this unless we really look at it from a psychological standpoint. Absolutely, it's very hard. Another question, what was the reaction of the Spanish government to the U.S. Supreme Court decision? Oh, uh, not pleased. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine. Well, first of all, Ruiz and Montez, they don't hang around in Connecticut too long. Like they, they get the heck out of there, right? I mean, they go back to Cuba and they sit there and they wait in the hopes that eventually when the case makes its way through the courts that um, they will uh, be rewarded. You know, they'll, they'll get back some, some of their losses, but they will wait in vain. And um, so the... 
in the Congress itself, a lot of the uh, congressmen and senators who are themselves enslavers will continue to argue this case among themselves that they have to pay reparations back to the Spanish just to keep the relationship decent. And the Spanish will continue to demand reparations all the way up to 1860. Wow. Um, but then it looks like war is on the horizon. So <laughs> when they start to see the United States fragmenting, then that's when they finally give it up. And, and that and that really helps us also to see where this story can kind of fit into that, you know, diplomacy lens of our past and our history. Adam has a question. Were those who thought the case should be launched on a kind of moral crusade, were they disappointed that Adams and others kept the focus clearly on international law? Uh, no, because, because at this point in the American abolitionist movement, they were still, um, they were still thinking that they would be able to persuade uh, enslavers to free their people. They hadn't yet mm -hmm. gone to the point where they thought they needed laws. So you see the shift in the American abolitionist movement where they go from persuasion and trying to persuade people to do the right thing, then to getting political. And in the 1850s, you start seeing them become political. They start running for public office. They start challenging laws in the 1850s. So it'll be a change. But at the time of uh, La Amistad, they're not quite there yet into getting involved in politics. Well, it's just so amazing because we have the hindsight and there's only 20 years or so between the case and when actually the Civil War begins. So it doesn't feel like it's a lot of time, but for, for a, a lot of that change to take place. But yeah, but you know, I was thinking this morning too, Lauren, um, you know, about this idea of the international slave trade. And some of our viewers may have seen this recently. They found the remnants of the Clotilda, mm -hmm. which was an American ship that had illegally brought Africans to Alabama. And uh, they burned the ship in, um, in the Mobile River. And it was recently found. There's a special on it about National Geographic and mm -hmm. descendants of those Africans still live live uh, in that area of where the ship was burned. And, and that was in 1860. So yeah, the practice continued. So you yeah. can see how the laws continue to be flouted yeah. by all countries. Yeah. I think that's all we have time for. And I thank you so much for helping us better understand a very, as you said in the beginning, a very complex but fascinating story that's so important for us to look at and to better understand our history. So Thank you, Dr. Mann, for being here. And thank you to all of our audience for continuing to support our programs. Remember to follow us on our social media channels at Naman Museum and tune into future programs. Thank you so much. And to thank you, Allison. And Thanks, we'll see Lauren. you next time. Okay. Bye, Diplomacy fans. Bye.